of, of guidance policy that's not necessarily been taken into consideration. That actually means we need more land than simply Sorry, my, 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 my apologies. So you said a few, you've said, well, you've used the phrase more land a few times. I think, I think are you saying in response to our question, allocate more land? Yes, please, sir. Thank you. That's helpful. Mr. Linus, was there anything in that you want to come back on or else I'm going to, I'm going to go to somebody else? Um, I think, again, I'm trying not to stray into the supply discussion that we're about to have because the way that we've translated the, the jobs growth figure um, into supply does take account in, of some of the factors that have been outlined, but perhaps I will park that for now. Um, but I quite agree with the need to bring forward our local plan. Our local plan allocates those sites, including um, on, on the estate mentioned, and it will unlock um, a significant amount of supply and enable it to come forward. So I would, I'd fully agree with, with that point that we need to move forward with our local plan, provide certainty around particularly those larger strategic site allocations, like on ST19, ST26, um, the largest of those allocations. I think you just add that no, I'm repeating a point that's been made before, but flexibility has been allowed both in terms of the uplift from the baseline forecasts, the extra supply that's been um, allowed for uh, uh, within, uh, within Table uh, 1, 4.1 as, as now amended. Um, so the Council has sought not to um, look specifically at past historic trends, but to take an aspirational approach to economic growth. Um, and that's reflected in uh, Table 1, 4.1, as well as the allocations. But, but we'll come back to the supply position shortly. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? Mr Chapman, go on. Thank you. I uh, just want to make a couple of points. Firstly, in relation to economic growth prospects in York, um, because it is worth noting that we do have data on how the economy has performed since uh, the Brexit vote and since these forecasts were produced, and it's performed very well, well above. Um, so this, is, this data is referred to in, in our hearing statement. Um, but ONS's data uh, suggests that in the last, well, since the Brexit vote, since 2016, uh, York has created 7,000 new jobs, which is well above a rate of 650 uh, new jobs per annum. So I, I suppose the key point is important not to be too gl gloomy about the long-term prospects for York. It's got a number of economic strengths. It's a highly skilled labour market. It's a very desirable place to live, all of which are very you know, significant strengths um, in a sort of post-COVID world. Um, but the, the second point I wanted to make was, um, and it's been made by a few people already, but I think it's really important, um, is that this is based on one approach, one economic forecast that was produced in 2016 and no other evidence. I, I appreciate the council has said that they have considered market signals as well, um, but I can't find that anywhere in the employment land reviews in the 2016 or 2017 employment land reviews. Um, I saw one page um, uh, which looked at the employment land market, but no analysis of market trends, no feedback from agents or analysis of occupier requirements. So the figures ultimately boil down to one forecast. And I'll explain using a, a, as an example the flaw in that approach. If you take the retail sector as an example, any employment forecast that's been produced in the last few years, certainly all the ones I've looked at, have said that jobs in retail are declining. But we know that what's actually happening in retail, so if you just use that in, in a standard employment land model, you would say retail is actually, is not generating any new demand for employment space. It's actually, demand is falling. But we know that within the retail sector, there's a lot of structural change going on. So yeah, the number of jobs in shops might be in decline, but the number of jobs in warehouses is going up and up uh, because of the, the move to online shopping. Those types of structural changes within sectors are completely missed by a standard employment land forecast, um, a sector-driven forecast model approach that needs to be combined with more qualitative evidence, market evidence, 
Um, it includes feedback from agents and speaks to local businesses and looks at how, you know, how the market is changing. Without that, I can't see how you can pin everything on uh, uh, figures that are based on a very out-of-date single forecast that has a number of flaws. Thank you. Go on. Well, I've taken you through the various points at which we have sensitivity tested that forecast, um, including since submission, so I won't, won't revisit that. Um, but again, I would, and I think I am straying into supply here, but just in response to the comments made, the forecast is not the only input into our supply response. Um, we highlighted uh, before you will see that there was no forecast demand for B2 floor space. B2 floor space is reflected in EC1, reflecting exactly the kind of engagement that we've set out in our um, Employment Land Review 2016, Section 4, which was referred to. So those market signals have been taken into account um, alongside those projections in defining supply. Um, I'm just um, to deal with the ONS point, I'll just start, invite my colleague to expand on, on, on that. Oh, yeah, I think that one of the, the forecasts do fluctuate a lot, and, the, and uh, one, of the, one of the challenges with um, a relatively small place, when you're looking at essentially survey-based data, which is what we're talking about here, is that there is a lot of inherent error in that because of the small sample size in a small place. You have to look at a long-term trend. It's, you, know, pick, you, could, you can pick various dates over the last 20 years and show very different Year, rates of jobs per year, depending on which end point and it, which start point you take. But if you take a long-term trend, um, which is what we've been sensitivity testing against, it, it shows that actually the underlying figures that we, we use do reflect what's happening in the long term um, it, 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 in the economy. The, the forecasts, yes, don't... Um, uh, 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 the, the 29 figures were... Um, when all the, the legislation was set out for Brexit, before it had all been enacted, um, and before um, COVID happened, and we've had a, a, a two-year freeze in the economy through COVID as well. So the, the, the forecasts will change. They are forecasts. The, the data published by ONS, although it sounds like it must be right because it's ONS and it's government, they themselves survey-based figures, and you, know, you have to be careful about picking particular end dates and particular start dates because you can show really whatever you want to from those st statistics uh, in terms of what the upward trend is. Mr. Manley? I do apologise. <laughs> I, should, I should know how to do that by now. Um, to give you an example, in terms of the baseline or scenario two figures, um, the evidence presented in the forecasting uh, calculates 480 jobs in total between 2017 and 2038 in education. That's to say 20 jobs per annum. In reality, the university between 2017 and 2022 has created 700 full-time equivalent jobs in the sector classed as education jobs. So there is a massive disconnect between what is going on at the university and what is assumed. And you need to understand that the university does actually account for over 4,000 of the 12,650 jobs in York classed in education. So it's a very big player. And, it can, and its activity can have a significant bearing on job creation, job forecasts, and so on. The other area of concern about these figures, the 650, is that there's an identification within that 650 
of 46% of the jobs being professional, scientific, technology and admin and support. And Mr. Breton told us actually a short time ago that they're looking to grow those sectors. They're looking to grow high value jobs. Well, again, the university has a science park on the West Campus, which is full. And since it got its Secretary of State's consent in 2007 for the East Park Campus, it's put 130 incubator and startup businesses on there. It's a massive attractor of inward investment and jobs. I don't know how that 650 figure in any way relates to an understanding of the way the university, which is a huge player in terms of what this authority is trying to do, no idea at all how it relates back to the university. And I can say with some confidence, see if I'm challenged on this, that nor do the authority, because they've never once sat down and spoken to us about it. We've tried repeatedly to engage and they've never asked us what we see as our growth program, what we see as the job creation potential in education, R&D, and all those other related things. So leaving aside my site-specific point, which I know you don't want to hear about, what am I asking you to do otherwise, sir? I'm asking you to tell them to talk to us because at the moment they're flying blind when it comes to the university. Um, in terms of the council's um, positive and proactive um, approach to economic growth, does that include the university? I'm also intrigued to know how the 650 figure relates to the university or whether the university is treated separately in some way. So I'll ask uh, uh, others to deal with the latter point as far as your first one uh, is concerned. Uh, I think in general terms, yes, the, the positive approach to growth um, does apply to the university as far as the council is concerned and that's reflected in the uh, allocation that's proposed within um, EC1. Um, I don't propose to get into site-specific matters um, uh, either today for reasons that uh, you'll understand as well as uh, Mr. Manley uh, understanding. Um, and I take uh, his hint that uh, the university wants more discussions with the council. Uh, we will say that we want to understand more about the university's uh, position. We can't say that we accept their desire for more land to achieve the ambitions which they've set out in their evidence. But rather than deal with that now as a site-specific matter, it's something we will discuss with the university and return to, I'm sure, through the site-specific um, uh, sessions. It's not a matter for, uh, it's not a matter for today. Yeah, yeah there, Mr. Man Mr. Manley did um, beseech us um, to, to, to ask you to talk to them. Yes. Um, will you do that, please? We will. Um, I, was, I was going to mention that later on. Uh, in this session today anyway, because other points have been raised by the university under other questions. Um, and uh, I can say that the council will speak to the uh, uh, university uh, as it's intended to. A couple of points, if I may, sir. Uh, my learned friend had been good enough to tell me that he was going to raise this willingness and indeed desire to speak to us later. What inflamed me and caused the flurry of activity was when Mr. Brereton said, that the 650 figure was in part the outcome of full engagement with relevant stakeholders. Um, that left me speechless, frankly. I'm not speechless for long, so I decided to put up my thing. Uh, the other thing is the vice chancellor has appeared and sat next to me and told me he wishes to say a few words. I'd, I'd ask you just to let him to do that. And then when he's finished, and that's finished, if we could just return to where that leaves us today, given that we've got a discussion <laughs> which has to be had, uh, where that leaves us today in terms of progressing our case today, because 
That has knock-on implications, it seems to me, for the Greenbelt session next week, for example, because before you can have any of these discussions, you have to have had a meaningful discussion about what the needs are. You may well say, well, okay, I take the view that those are the needs, but I'm sorry you can't have them because it's too damaging environmentally. But you do have to understand what the needs are. So I would like to return to that very briefly, if I could, after the Vice Chancellor has spoken. Thank you. Uh, may I? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to explain just how important it is, not just for the university, but also for city and region to make provision in the local plan for the growth of the footprint of the university. Uh, and I'd like to offer comments across two timescales. Uh, the first timescale is the period uh, from 2018 when this process started. Um, we've gone through some really significant change since then, which I think questions many of the assumptions that were made back in uh, 2018. Uh, the university has grown, notwithstanding COVID, it has grown really significantly. Uh, we have grown by 190 jobs per year over that period. Um, now, 190 is a quite large proportion of 650. Uh, we, we think that with those and with the knock-on effects of, uh, of, of our work in creating other employment opportunities, we've been driving 300 jobs uh, a year uh, in that period, which is pretty much half of that, that 650. Uh, we've seen very significant growth in student demand, both international and domestic in that period, even despite uh, COVID. Uh, we've seen in that period a very significant shift in student housing preferences. Uh, we have more international students. International students tend to prefer managed accommodation in residences. And we're seeing growing demand for managed accommodation also among home undergraduate students beyond the traditional first year in halls, not least because of a tightening of private sector housing supply in the city. So we are going to need to build more residences for those two reasons. Uh, in the intervening period since 2018, we've, we've developed a new university strategy through to 2030. The first sentence of that says that the University of York exists for public good. Uh, we have a number of areas where University of York research is at the global forefront, addressed at some of the world's biggest challenges. Bioeconomy, fusion energy, robotics and autonomous systems, digital creativity, new communications technologies, green chemistry, mental health. Uh, we are developing new ideas and new technologies for public good and we need new facilities so that we can maximize the benefits to our society from that. And there's a wider significance too. All of those things are magnets for economic opportunity for city and region as we work with both public and in particular private sector partners to develop commercial applications. You heard from, from our QC a little about the business incubation activity that we've engaged in in the last few years. Beyond that, it's really striking how our science is at the heart of a range of economic development initiatives. We're working on very directly and very closely uh, with the City Council and other public authorities in the region. Uh, there's currently a bid to host Great British Railways on York Central. Uh, we're currently in discussion with other potential anchor tenants at York Central, the biggest economic development site uh, underway in the, in the UK uh, at, at the moment. Uh, and all of that rests on, very directly on, the university's research strengths. Uh, you may have noticed that, that Gould, just down the road, a few miles down the road, has been shortlisted as a potential site for uh, an experimental UK fusion power plant. That's happened because of the fusion science that we do at the university. And if that comes off, that will bring billions, I mean literally billions of capital investment and all the knock-on uh, supply chain effects into this uh, region. It's going to create a lot of employment if that uh, comes off. Our bioeconomy expertise is at the heart of this region's devolution deal uh, plans as presented to government by the City of York Council uh, and North Yorkshire County Council. And we all expect 
that that will lead to a, an uplift of GVA of 1.4 billion per year and give this region a huge push to becoming the UK's first carbon negative uh, region. What I'm trying to say with that is that we, we don't just need new facilities to do fantastic breakthrough science, which we do, um, but it's because, it's not just an inward looking purpose, it's because that science drives economic opportunity and growth and jobs for city and region which otherwise wouldn't be there. Now our, our estimate is that the University of York currently generates around about 2.5 billion pounds per year of added value through its presence, through its research, through its students, with about one third of that uh, uh, recognized directly here in the city of York. What I'm saying here, there is much, much more to come. Uh, all of that, I think, is change since 2018. My second time scale is one which extends uh, over the next few decades. Uh, my responsibility is to think about the long-term needs of the university long after I will have retired. Now, after um, the current situation is that after growth in the last decade, we have very little further development space. We are almost full. Our capacity to repurpose our older facilities is highly constrained by extensive listing, both of buildings, but in particular of landscape, which really impacts on the development possibilities. And there are a range of other planning restrictions which limit what we can do. Now those constraints are balanced to an extent by some of the lessons we've drawn through COVID about how to work differently, which I think will reduce the square meterage we're going to need in future per employee. But that's not going to outweigh the growing demand for managed student accommodation, nor the need to invest in new facilities to address social challenges which affect us all and open up economic opportunity for city uh, and region. So the need for additional expansion space is pressing and I think the wider benefit to city and region is clear. Uh, one last comment if I may. It's really important that expansion space is contiguous to the current campus. All the fields I mentioned, from bioeconomy to digital creativity to, to mental health, they rest on collaboration across academic disciplines. They don't happen in a building which is isolated from work in other buildings. To get the benefit from the intersections across those disciplines, uh, we need to have expansion space located close by so our academics can work and our students can learn fluidly uh, across those discipline boundaries. We need to expand, but to realize all the many, many benefits we can bring, we need to expand in our near vicinity. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to put a, a, a bit of context around the issues uh, from, from the university's perspective. That's, um, that's very helpful. Um, thank you for that. I was going to come back to saying that that still leaves the question of where we go today. I, I, it seems to me you're going to find it, frankly, not very helpful to hear us reiterating our case today because you're going to say, well, I, for whatever reason, there's no point in going behind it. York need to engage with it further. They freely admit that. We understand that. We embrace that and wish to do that. But we would given that we're now in inquiry and that there are other sessions looming, we would like some kind of commitment to time scales, some kind of commitment to a statement of common ground, even if it only clearly sets out where we agree to disagree. Um, because you have seen, we've put a substantial body of evidence in, in 2018, and I think it's only now being engaged with. Um, be that as it may, it does underline that we need to get our skates on with this. So we're happy to walk away today, but only on the understanding that we have some kind of timetable. Now, I'm happy to sort that outside of the inquiry today uh, on the understanding that it is then put before you the draft for your approval, and then we will work to it in order to assist the inquiry. Um, Perhaps, um, because it does feel to me as though um, we're ready for a break, um, certainly I am, um, that we, we might usefully take that now. 
um, and, and you can have a, a quick discussion, and which hopefully will have a positive outcome for us when we return. And um, I will shortly after need to go to um, Mrs. Cook because I know she's been incredibly patient um, up there. Um, does that sound like a plan? Good. Well, what, what should we say? 15 minutes? Perhaps a bit longer? 15 is fine. 25 past then we'll resume. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>